everybody. Welcome. I'm so excited to be um, having conversation in the comment section already. Um, we all, I told you, I, I told everybody last week that we were going to be doing a tarantula hawk this week. So your tarantula hawk is right here waiting for us and it is still on the board, but I figured if I was going to be taking it off right now, I might as well take it off under camera so you get to see that too. Yay, it's the Pepsis! So we have Avea here, we have Susan here, and I believe we had April here for a minute, but I don't know if she stuck around or if she was coming back. Um, so this funny story, this tarantula hawk wasp was actually collected pretty much in the exact same place that the leaf beetle that we collected last time was. So when we go over to that screen and I have the background behind me, um, that is still the same background or the same type of environment that I collected this insect in, except it's looking in the other direction because this guy, or um, this um, individual was flying around a flower. Um, and yes, we were talking about um, chrysalids instead of emerging as butterflies into parasito parasitoids, um, parasitic wasps. And those wasps ending up in the freezer and then possibly ending up in my collection, um, that would be super awesome. Um, but, like you said, we're not sure if they're going to be emerging shortly or if they'll emerge in next spring, so just keep me updated, of course. Um, and, you know, if you find a small insect out there and you're in the United States, because I can't import anything, but if you're out there in the United States and you find a cool bug that you'd like to see under the microscope, I wonder if I could set something up where you could send me bugs. Plus, um, it would be kind of cool to pin insects and, like, identify them and stuff, um, from people all over the place. That would be really cool. Um, yay! All right, so, um, we're going to go ahead and take our board, take this, um, tarantula hawk off of the board. So, um, Pepsis, uh, is the genus. It would be P-E-P-S-I-S. -S. It's so pretty. Um, right now it looks mostly black. But when we get it into the light, and hopefully when it's underneath the microscope, its legs are going to look metallic blue. And sorry, my fingers are throwing this camera out of focus and making it go back in. I guess I didn't turn its autofocus off. Hawks, because they have really big tarsal claws, they have really big claws in the bottom of their feet, um, those claws will kind of hold on to the styrofoam. But it looks like... She let go pretty easy, but ha, she's carrying a piece of styrofoam with her. See? <laughs> let go, babe. All right. Let's take her under the microscope. She did finally let go of that um, piece of styrofoam, too. <clears throat> hi, Aisha! Um, hi, Deb! <laughs> Susan goes, big-legged bug? Uh, this is a tarantula hawk! Yeah, she is absolutely gorgeous, and if we really zoom in at this head, um, and we check out these eyes, they're these really, really pretty metallic silvery color, and then the, her actual chitin, her exoskeleton, is like this metallic blue. Yay! I wonder, oh yes, I think that, I 
my screen, it might be just a little bit off. Give me two moments to fix this. That's better. Somebody spray painted her silver. It does look like it, right? And I think that, ooh, we're going to move some of those bugs. Sometimes the bugs get too close to my hands and I don't want to knock anything over. All right. I want to see how close we can get to those eyes because I really like, I think that this is a really awesome pattern. Yeah, whoever said golf ball, I think you are exactly right. <laughs> the blue ones. I love that. Yes, so um, I guess I've fallen in love with metallic things. Last Thursday, we did that really beautiful metallic beetle. This week, we're going to be doing this Pepsis that is also absolutely gorgeous. Um, as you know, Pepsis are a genus of wasp, and they are called tarantula hawks. All right, so let's see. I think they're a Pompilid, but something weird happened in that family. Yes, they're still a Pompilid. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and give you the... That's the scientific name for the family of wasps, and a little bit later when we're actually looking at a variety of the characteristics, I can show you um, the characteristic on this specimen of what makes them at least in that family. Um, I'm honestly not sure what the specific characteristic is to make it a pepsis and and not another species of pompilid except that they are huge um a lot of these pepsis are metallic blue black and then they'll have either black or orange wings and so they have these really really absolutely beautiful colors i'm gonna go ahead and let's see i get this stuff set up i'm gonna go ahead and bring her back over here just for a minute because you need to know how big she is um, and she is not fitting underneath the microscope in one image. Um, I'm not going to go from the front of her antenna. I'm going to go from the front of her head to the back of the abdomen. So her abdomen does end a little bit shorter than her wings. All right, so um, it looks like she's about 3.8, 3.8 centimeters. So definitely over an inch and a half long um, for those of you who use the, uh, the English system. She's definitely over an inch and a half long. She's pretty large. And you know, when I saw her, when I, when I saw her flying by, I had decided that I wasn't going to collect another Pepsis because I do have a couple of them in my collection, but she was so big. Um, I haven't looked at her because you saw me just take her off of the board. So I haven't looked at her in comparison to my other Pepsis in the collection. But I will be curious to see. Now, I was thinking we might draw her laterally rather than dorsally. So I was thinking we might draw her from the side rather than on the top. But I want to go ahead and see what she looks like from the side to see if that's kind of realistic. I just think that she has... Oh, look at how cool she is! All right. So... <clears throat> Her mouth parts are pretty obvious. We've got Terry here to help us out. Um, let's see. 
um, her mouth parts are kind of fun because if we look at her head on, we're going to see that she has both mandibulate or chewing mouth parts and this straw like part of her mouth. So, um, as an adult, tarantula hawks a lot of times feed on nectars and sugars. So you'll find them at freshly flowering plants or even at trees that are, that are gushing sap. They're really, really hunting for sugary natural goodness. Um, these right here, um, two on the bottom, two on the left and two on the right. So let's see, there's this, these two, and then on the far one on the bottom here and the far one on the top over here, those are the labial and maxillary palps. Um, we call them mouth fingers for short. Um, Yes, and the bumps aren't even the individual eyes. They are actually significantly smaller. Um, if you are curious about scientific names for things, because I like to share them with people, let's see if I can spell it. Um, it's Omatidia. There might be one M. Give me two seconds to make sure that I spelled that right. Oh, look at me, I did. Okay, so... Um, the individual cells in an insect's compound eye are called omatidia. So instead of calling them bumps or individual eyes, you can call them omatidia. Um, these guys up here that are kind of like little segmented fingers up here, we call them um, labial palps. And um, the common name for that the name that I like to call them is mouth fingers because they're up here and essentially their goal is to push food down into their mouth or to help guide food towards, um, towards, you know, their mouth hole. <laughs> so, um, very, very good. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and scooch this specimen down really quick. I wanna just look at the rest of the body. The antenna seem the antenna seem good in this position. Terry, get out of the way. Alright. Oh, look at the the hairs, the fine hairs on the legs. That's pretty awesome. And those spines. And so those orange guys right there, those are their wings. This Pepsis had bright orange wings when it was flying by. Yeah. <laughs> April, I love that. I feel like any of the, you know, people who like drop crumbs out of the corners of their mouths and stuff, all you need are a couple extra mouth fingers up there. i help you not drop things. <laughs> if, only, uh, if only we could choose our adaptations. I'm going to double check and see that we can see the characteristic for the family from this side. Uh. Oh, okay. I can see it from this side. So we are going to be sketching it laterally, but we're going to be sketching it laterally with the head pointing left because I can see the mesococcal plate from this side. So when I'm sketching it, I can show you that characteristic. So what I think I'm going to do, because I know that a lot of us like to get the overall sketch done first, and then to go back in for fine details, I'm going to go ahead and get her kind of in focus just on the head right here, and then I'm going to pull her off to the side and put her on top of my paper, like this. And maybe this will 
will help sketch her. All right, so um, I always go ahead and write our name on the top. We are doing so oh man. I go and spell omatidia right and then miss up pepsis. P-E-P-S-I-S. -E All right, so we've got pepsis on our paper, and because I'm sketching it laterally, I'm actually going to turn the paper, because I know me, and my sketches get big quickly on accident. So, um, she keeps, she's so heavy, she keeps turning the pin. So if you see me go ahead and move her, um, I just like to make sure she's not going to get injured in any way. We can figure out where the light is by the location of the highlight. I love that. <laughs> Uh, yes, my light comes off from the left-hand side, uh, but you would laugh at me if you actually saw my lighting set up, because I've got, like, one over there, and one over there, and, like, one over there. I've got all types of lights happening to make sure the green screen works and the microscope works and everything. All right, so, um, I always start my sketch from the head, and I think it's pretty convenient that we have the head also on the microscope right there. So you can see that the head is actually disconnected from the thorax just a little bit. You can see that Pepsis does have a little bit of a neck here. Um, when I'm first starting my sketches, a lot of times, I'm going to go ahead and give it kind of the back of the head. Let's see. So this... <laughs> need to make sure that it's approximately the right size. I always do this first sketch really, really light, so I'm sorry if it's a little bit more difficult to see. Um, I like to do the first one light, and then I go over it heavy. So we've got this neck area, and then our head comes up and down. Um, you can kind of see where... Actually, the, um, the leg is going right over where the mouth parts would be. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that the head comes kind of down at an angle and then comes all the way over. But the head actually kind of dead ends quite abruptly. And then after that, you have the mouth parts, um, which are going to be your kind of chewing mouth parts, which from the side are going to be very triangular. And then you also have your, um, we're, we're going to call them for this insect, we're going to call them lapping mouth parts, L-A-P-P-I-N-G, lapping, um, because it's not, um, it's not like a sucking motion. They don't really have a proboscis where they're drinking nectar. It's more like having a tongue that sticks out. That's kind of what it's like. Um, we also have those pelpy, um, or we can call them pelps. They're mouth pelps, the mouth fingers. Oh, there's a velvet worm. Ha! He uh, made a made a landing on the day today. All right, so we've got those guys right here, and this mm, this um, this pelp looks like it is about three segments. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of give my pelps three segments. And I'm not going through and doing it hard. I just want to kind of give myself an idea of what's happening here. All right. And so I've got my head. And then when I move back to my thorax, I know that um, a lot of times the thorax is very rectangular or very square. Um, that's just because um, squares or boxes are easier for insects to kind of connect all their muscles to, um, especially muscles that they help move their legs and their wings. The thorax is where all 10 moving appendages are. Um, so our thorax, I'm going to approximate the shape. So it is a little hunched. It comes up and then it angles down maybe about here. Doop, doop, doop. Doop, doop, doop. 
Alrighty. Look at me drawing my wasp too big. I just said I wasn't going to do that. It's fine. I think that'll be better. Wasp out of way. Alright, so that'll give me, it looks like, enough room to give all three legs. And I'll show you how those legs connect. Um, our, our tarantula hawk wasp does have what we call a wasp waist. So in between the second and third body parts. Oh man, I wish I remembered the wasp turn for that. Um, anyway, we do have a wasp waist, so where the abdomen connects is actually kind of down here. And then it expands up and out. And look, as long as I erase these words, my Pepsis is going to fit on the paper. <clears throat> so, yes. The pedestal is that wasp waist. Um, it's that segment that kind of connects the thorax to the abdomen. Um, I was trying to think of, I think the word that I was trying to think of was prosoma. Metasoma consists of the second abdominal segment. So I guess the reason why I was looking for another word is because there is a weird um, there's a weird segment on what you would call the thorax here. I will uh, I'll walk you through my entire thought process really quick. Um, and there is a word for it, which I was just looking for. But um, I don't want to spend too much time kind of just looking. So I'll show you. So yes, a pedestal is both entomology and botany, which is fun. I love when we can find words that match for both. Um, a lot of times when we're talking three, a lot of times when we are talking three segments or three body parts of an insect, we will call them the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, right? So that's what we always call them. Um, now there's this weird thing that happens in wasps, and that is that there is an area which looks like it should be the thorax, but it generally includes the first section, the first segment of the abdomen too. So right about here, um, this, this is our thorax, right? We've got our first leg, our second leg, our third leg, um, and our wings are connected. Um, then we have, like Susan said, the pedestal. The pedestal is a part of the abdomen, but it looks like it starts over here kind of on the thorax. It gets really tiny. It's this little wasp waist, and then... Um, Technically, we would say the abdomen, this first segment of what looks like the abdomen is actually the second segment of the abdomen. Um, so there's this weird um, naming system when it comes just to bees and wasps because of that. Instead of saying a head, the thorax, and the abdomen, sometimes they'll say the prosoma, the mesosoma, and the metasoma. Um, that's where I was going, but I didn't want it to get too complicated. Uh, 
Alrighty. So I think we have our had our Thor our all three body parts that are sketched. Um, let's see. Come back. That's awesome that your Trogus has an iridescent orange body. I definitely want to see that. Um, if I was going to go ahead and add um, my legs onto my thorax um, for the, kind of like the stick version, I would go ahead and give them the coxal plates on here. Um, these are kind of large circular plates that the that are essentially the hip bones of the insect. The legs connect in there. Um, so we've got the first one, the second one, and then the third one back here. This is it would be kind of where our legs would connect. Keeping in mind that our thorax is broken into three divisions, and then um, we get. The just like the just like in humans have a femur and a tibia for our bones, they have a femur and a tibia. So it would be a femur coming up like this, the tibia coming down, and then we call these next segments, we call them we call them tarsi, spelled like this. And that's essentially their toe segments, right? That's where their claws are at the end. And um, humans have something very similar that we call our metatarsals, right? That's what we call our toe bones. All right. I feel like I'm just a little bit behind in sketching. I had too much fun chatting with you guys in the beginning. Sorry. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to zoom in on the head. We're going to start doing some really, I'm not behind? Good. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> And then when I think too hard, my mouth opens, so oh, I love it. This is great. So, oh my goodness, from this angle, we can also see the ocelli. Um, for those of you out there who, this might be your first time, you might not recognize that word. Um, it is our scientific name for the simple eyes. Um, ocelli is plural to the word ocellus. And you can see that there are three dots right up here in a triangular fashion. And those are our Pepsis's ocelli. I'm not sure exactly what species of Pepsis. Um, so I've been putting SP. I will eventually identify them. Susan, that was a good eye. Yes, there is a crazy tibial spine on this pepsis right here. Um, a lot of times, tibial spines, especially on the front legs, are going to be used for cleaning antenna. I would not be surprised if they also used it to clean his mouth parts. All right, so when I'm sketching my Pepsis, I'm actually going to, do you see how they're, oops, I forgot to change the focus back down. <clears throat> I'm trying to get the focus on the majority of the head, the front leg and the back leg and the antenna might be a little out, but my goal is the majority of the head. So we've got our friend getting sketched here. We're working up here on the head. Um, you can see kind of the back of the head, how the light so harshly hits that edge and then it goes dark. Um, Terry, what about you? Right here. So you see there's this edge right here. And um, 
Uh, that's gonna be, there is an edge or a lip there, and so I guess from a little bit earlier when you guys were talking about lighting, this would, that would be a kind of a good hint that you could get from lighting, is that there is a fairly drastic edge there, kind of a sharper turn that goes more t in towards the body, and that's why that area is not really picking up light. Um, shadowing is definitely one of those things that I could work on, um, but... Um, we'll see how that works. All right, um, we've got our head here. And I made this very rounded up in the top, but I'm actually going to straighten it out a little bit. It's not as rounded as I gave it credit for. Um, let's see, more like this. And kind of streamlined down towards um, in between the antenna or antenna segments. That's probably a better shape for my head, for at least the top of my head. And I'm going to erase this line here. Okay. I'm um, purposely avoiding where I think that the, uh, where I think that the leg is going to go through because I don't want to make that area too harshly dark. I don't know exactly where it's coming through just about yet. All right, now our eye, actually the shape of our compound eye gives a lot of, um, gives a lot of shape to also the head of our specimen. Um, so if you draw your compound eyes kind of rounded, you can give a very rounded looking shape to the head. Um, in this case, I'm going to try and make them a little more narrow towards the top and kind of wider towards the bottom, maybe something like that. Yeah. Um, maybe even bigger though. Let's see, you can see our, we have an, our antennal sockets are gonna be right about here. Maybe what I need is to flatten this out just a little bit. That's better. All right. Um, and then I've got my eyes. And those beautiful silver eyes are pretty large. So make sure you give them the space that they that they need. Um, and we have those three ocelli up here at the top. They are pretty small, right? So they are simple eyes. They're nothing compared to these giant compound eyes. Um, but... Uh, not every wasp out there has them. So when they have them, we like to throw them in the sketch. Um, Ocelli pretty much always come, well, if they're on the top of the head of a wasp and it's an adult, I would say they pretty much always have three of them. I can't think of any insect ever that only has one ocellus. Um, caterpillars have simple eyes, so they have ocelli, but generally they have more than three. Um, they'll have like six to eight ocelli on each side, so they're going to have, what, 12 to 16 of them total. Um, but I think that if an insect has them when they're adults, they're going to have a set of three. When you look at the eyes directly, do you see that grid of light and dark on the eyes, or does it only appear through the camera? Let me look. Looks like that in person too. I could just barely spot the ocelli in my spice bush caterpillar's eyes. Yes. No. Caterpillar ocelli are. I actually, I have the caterpillar book 
have sitting right next to me. I will show you the, I'll show you um, a sketch of a caterpillar head. So caterpillars, <clears throat> when you're identifying a caterpillar, a lot of times you are going to be well, there's a handful of very key characteristics that you use for caterpillars. Um, you use the eye configuration. You use the shape and number of crochets, which are the little claws on the bottom of the pro legs. Um, and you use their hair configuration. So... Um, you may be surprised that caterpillars, every single caterpillar out there has their hairs numbered. You can actually look up kind of hair charts for caterpillars, and that's how we identify them. I, was, I promise you this this exists. Okay, here we go. Do they call them stomata instead? All right. So, here's some fun things that I can show you. This is a caterpillar book. Um, these are the charts, our caterpillar charts. So these are essentially one segment on the edge of the abdomen, um, and it has each individual hair, where it is, and what the name of it is. But if you look up here, you can see these kind of dots and these kind of funny shapes. Those um, dots are the eye spots of the caterpillars. And so this caterpillar has six eye spots, um, and they're shaped in the set of four and then a double two. Yes. Um, right. Caterpillars do not have compound eyes. They only have these simple eyes. And I thought that they were called ocelli. I really did. But there's now a part of me that feels like they have another, a different word for them. So I was just looking to see if there was a different word for caterpillar eyes. <laughs> um, how funny would that be? But, okay, so this will work. This is an image of the whole caterpillar's head. And so that's what I wanted to show you. Let's see if I can get it right. Um, this is a caterpillar head. Right here, that's the antenna. It's just like this little peg, and it has this little itty-bitty hair coming off of it and that's the antenna and then those that little half circle of dots those are the eye spots and no caterpillars do not have compound eyes i don't know how well they see um i wouldn't think that they see great with those little itty bitty eyes but where are those eye spots yes Let's see. Yes. Sorry, I'm catching up on reading your comments. So they have a face mask that has two big bumps that look like eyes, but the actual ocelli are teeny tiny on the sides of the face. Exactly. They're way over here, kind of closer to the mouth. They are so incredibly tiny and a lot of times are even the same color as the head. All right. So it's not like you're going to have a bright green caterpillar and have black eyes. A lot of times the bright green caterpillars have a green that's just slightly lighter in their eye color than the rest of the head. Um... <laughs> yeah, so 
I was actually talking. All right, we're going to get back to sketching this wasp, but I will continue talking about the caterpillar. And I'm sorry, we just lost another person. We got so derailed. I'm sorry. Okay. All right, our person came back. We win. Okay, so, um... Yeah, I was actually talking about that with a student today. We were imagining that we were caterpillars, right? And our eyes were very poor, you know? We could only really smell and sense the world around us. Um, uh, and we had only ever eaten the host plant that we landed on, right? So, our, so the butterfly lays the egg. The caterpillar is just on this plant and luckily the egg hatches on the plant that it eats and then it gets to eat its food and grow and hopefully there's another very closely related plant next door if it finishes its entire food um but it goes through this entire season having very poor eyesight and not having great antenna and just stuffing itself with food all the time um, it goes into a chrysalis, which is completely dark, right? We do have evidence to show that insects, that butterflies can actually, like, remember being caterpillars. Um, there were experiments done where they kind of taught caterpillars something or another, and they saw if they remembered it kind of after they emerged, and the truth was that they could. Um, so... Uh, that we do have proof that caterpillars can, or butterflies can kind of, like, remember their being a caterpillar. And, um, in the chrysalis stage, they completely turn into goo, right? Their chewing mouth parts become a drinking mouth part, and when they emerge from their chrysalis, they can see in color and images, and they have these giant compound eyes to see the world with. And they can fly. Like, really cool trans transformation. And if you think about it, like, what it would be like to live that type of life, I, it's wild. So, you know. It's a fun train to go down. And then, um, there was proof out there that insects can now, like, there's now proof that insects can feel pain. Um, and so I do wonder, like, what it feels like to an animal that can feel pain to go into a chrysalis and completely liquefy. Yeah, so some, you mentioned, um, you mentioned trying to give a monarch butterfly a species of milkweed plant that they had never had before, and that's a good thing to mention because there are some immature insects, um, definitely some, definitely some walking sticks and, and, and some caterpillars that whatever is the first type, the first species of plant that they eat, that is the type of plant that they will be able to eat for the rest of their lives. And if they run out, they will actually starve. Um, it has to do with their microbiome. Um, the first plant that they ever eat, um, essentially their stomach microbiome gets used to um, feeding on that type of plant. Um, and then, uh, when they try and eat something else, they actually don't have the gut microbe to digest it. So sometimes when a caterpillar is being picky about what it's eating, it might be because they just don't have what it takes in their stomach to, um, to digest their food properly. I'm trying to get these labial pulps right because I think that they are super nifty. So I see these are the two bottom ones. There's, oh, the other top one comes up this way. You know what? I'm 
happy the way it is. Okay. Um, so I drew one antenna instead of two. And I'm going to, oh, actually, I want to curl this more in a little bit. So you can see, let's see, I didn't count the segments. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Looks like approximately 11 segments. I have a harder time sketching up there because my camera gets in the way. So you can see that they have a curly Q antenna. And honestly, I love the curly Q antenna and it's common in Pepsis. So if you see these curly antenna, or, and it's also common in Pompilid, so like the entire family, when they pass, they have these really cute curly an antenna. Ow! I think I have an insect mounting pin on my floor. Okay. Okay. So I've got my antenna taken care of. We have our mouth taken care of. I'm, let's move on back to the thorax. We get to move the image. Welcome back, microscope. Welcome back. My microscope got tired. It said it. you stopped paying attention to me. I'm going to restart my microscope and read your comments. Book recommendations on caterpillars. I would love to have a great book recommendation for caterpillars. Um, I haven't found a great I haven't found a great, like, um, field guide where it had a lot of pictures and stuff. I haven't found a great real field guide for caterpillars. Um, if you were going to be doing keys, my camera doesn't want to come back. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have to... Um, I might have to close this out really quick. I will be right back. I promise. All right. So I am back. Um, and I had a handful of questions that I wanted to answer quickly. Um, one was the question about Caterpillar books. I don't have a really, really great one. Um, there is this book right here. It's called The Lepidoptera of the Pacific Northwest. And so if you're living in the Northwest, there is a really good book for the caterpillars and the adults out there. Um, these are example images from this photo book. Um, there's also a Lepidoptera of the Pacific Northeast done by a comp competing author, I believe. So those are two good books if you are in those regions, but there's not really a good caterpillar book for the entire United States. Um, there are good, really good keys, but also they're getting a little old. Um, David Wagner's Caterpillar books. There you go. I don't have those ones. Um, So the antenna curl up not just in death, but the antenna are curled up naturally in life too. So if you see them curl, if you see them flying around, they'll have curly antenna. Where do the labial palps attach? Sorry, I must have.
have missed out on a handful of your questions. Microscope is being a pain right now. There it goes. So the labial palps, all right, the labial palps connect to the labium and the maxillary palps connect to the maxillary. Which is, the maxillary pulps are like around the mandibles. So I'll show ya. So they are a part of the mouth. So they're all connected in kind of this mouth region. Um, there are a set of palps that are connected to the bottom jaw, essentially, of our pepsis. So if Terry comes out here to help, these are the, um, these are the labial palps. They're the ones on the bottom. And they're right here, kind of connected down on the bottom of their mouth. And then you've got the maxillary palps. If I zoom up just a little bit, there's one right here. And you can see it's connected right here. So if I had mandible the maxillary palp is connected kind of right behind the mandible and and then depending on the species some of them are going to be kind of up and some of them are going to be kind of down but they're right in that region um so i hope that helps with that and the eyes really, really do look silver, and even in, um, uh, you had me look under just my normal eyes without the microscope, and then the eyes still do have that pattern, even with the naked eye. Um, and yes, um, you guys keep saying silver and gold. In person, the antenna look, or the eyes look silver to me. But, you know, it's funny because this could be a whole nother the dress is gold or the dress is blue situation, right? Um, to me, the eyes are silver. Someone else said it. I wonder if it's like the dress. Yeah, that's funny. Oh, that's, <laughs> thought something stung me from the collection. Oh, that's funny. Um, yeah, I mean, admittedly, I've collected a handful of insects, and I've definitely been stung by a good number of them, but I have never been stung by an insect actively in my collection. So I think that there is this misconception that insects can actually sting and envenomate you after they pass. Um, the specimens that I have are dry specimens, right? They're no longer moving anywhere. Their muscles are all dried out, which means that likely their venom sac is all dried out too. So, um, I have worked with many, many bees and wasps in collections. I have even physically put my finger on a stinger before and have not gotten stung. Yes, they can pierce your skin still if they are hard and they were pushed out um, when the insect was dying. The um, stingers do have the ability to kind of like pierce your skin, but it doesn't hurt because you're not, there's no venom involved. Um, <clears throat> we do have a little bit of a humpback, but it doesn't go too high above the wasp's head. So I was just trying to calm my, calm my humpback down a little bit. Um, we also right about here have that, um, 
have that shoulder guard for our wasp's wings. So that's going to help protect all of those muscles underneath the wings. I like to draw them in this D shape. So you can go ahead and kind of sketch. It's going to be on closer to the edge. Um, this kind of D shape where you've got the rounded side towards the body and the flat side towards the wings. And the wings are going to be out in this direction. And I admittedly, I'm just going to put this line out here so that I kind of know where the wings go. But I know that the wings are going to be a little more complex than I'm probably going to want to sketch today. So we'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> all right. So those are called the tegula. Yeah, they're called the tegula, T-E-G-U-L-A. Those are the shoulder pads. Oof. How about a book on wasps? Um, so a book on wasps. There is a really good identification book for all of the families of, of Hymenopteran in North America. And I believe that it is freely available on the internet, um, as a PDF. You just have to download it. Um, and that's why I haven't purchased it. I think it's a little bit older now, but the families would the families and the keys would still be correct. And they remember the images being really good. And it included the parasitoids, but it was only down to family and not down to species. It was like 500 pages or something like that. Um <clears throat> Zombies digging back from the dead. Yeah, luckily. Huh. Oh, oh, like back from the dead. Yeah, luckily I have not had any insects come back from the dead since I was like nine, ten in that area. Sometimes, well, actually, I think I had one come back when I was in college when I was making my collection. That's never fun. And that one was actually a B. All right. Um, we're going to look at this first, and then we can go and talk about my experience about the bees. So this is what, this is the reason why, this is the reason why I decided to do this side of the body and not the other side of the body. Pepsis are in the family Pompilidae. Pompilidae are all of the spider wasps or cricket hunters are in this family. Um, a lot of them have very thin waists. A lot of them um, are parasitic on s different types of spiders, different types of tarantulas, different types of crickets and grasshoppers, um, some katydids. And um, <clears throat> so when we are looking at this guy right here, our tarantula hawk, we want to be able to identify our pompilid down to family. Every single species in the family pompilidae has a split mesococcal plate. Um, so to give you guys an idea of where that is and what I'm talking about, um, <clears throat> this right here is the connection to the first leg. This is the coxa, and the femur is coming out towards us. This is the coxa for the middle leg, and our femur is coming out in this direction, and then the tibia comes back down. If we look, and it's kind of dark, and I wish I could get it to be brighter. I can darken it, but I can't make it any brighter than what it is. Um, <clears throat> right here, you can see that there is a line or a break in this plate. This is on the 
the middle coxy, and every single species in Pompilid has that. And so if we zoom out, you can still see the characteristic all the way out here, but I just wanted to make sure that we saw it close up. So this is our first leg, this is our second leg, there's that little horizontal line right about here, and that is the characteristic for the family. That's how you know. That's how you know that he loves you. <clears throat> yes, the tegula is, if we look right about here, that little D-shaped plate up there, that's the tegula. Scapulars for birds. That's interesting. Are the hairs on the thorax just on the front or all over the thorax? I believe that those hairs are He's got hairs he definitely has a little bit of hair all over the thorax. It's not just up here. It is most obvious up here and the hairs are more common on the ventral side of its body. Up on the top you can see it's nice and smooth so there aren't a lot of hairs up here but on the legs and on the bottom side of the body you have a lot of hairs. Um, this is an insect that you will see covered in pollen during the right time of the year. And yes I am enjoying Ant Hill. Thank you so much Deb for sending it my way. In fact I am still enjoying Ant Hill because I have to admit that I have not yet finished it. I am, um, I'm a good way into the book and I've been really enjoying it. Um, I, I had a prop, um, I have a, a, a program that I'm trying to build and I'm just a little bit behind on it. And so I haven't been able to read every night because I've been working on a project. And hopefully when my project finishes up, I'll be able to share pieces of it and pieces of the videos and stuff that I create on my YouTube channel. So that's going to be exciting. I'll have some new content coming up. Um, I just have to finish all of like the school stuff part of it first. All right, so I wanted to go ahead and zoom out a little bit so that I could see this leg here. Our wasp is taking a while to sketch. I, uh, I'm sorry about that. All right, so we're looking at here. This is our femur, and this is our tibia. Our femur is kind of wider at the base and kind of more narrow at the top, and then our tibia is nice and thin, and it has that really awesome tibial spine, so we can check that out for sure. And then moving forward, any of those segments after are they are, are its tarsal segments or its little toe segments. And so we can go ahead and push it forward to see how many they have. So it looks like we've got one, two, three, four, um, approximately five tarsal segments on our pompillid. Um, so we're going to go ahead and sketch that. Do any bugs ever appear to die only to have a parasite emerge from them later? You know, um, praying mantids are common for that. Um, there are praying mantids that get horsehair worms, and the horsehair worm only emerges from the praying mantis after the mantis dies. So if you're asking about an insect that dies and then a parasite emerges, the thing, the one that I think about is, um, or I guess are, uh, praying mantids, but also caterpillars do the same thing. So, um, there are some caterpillars that will be parasitized and they will be essentially dead, but still walking around um, because, um, I guess they still have their, like, essential body parts. They're, like, essential organs, but all of the other stuff is being eaten away by parasitoids. Um, 
So there is that. So they can emerge after they are dead. Um, I even believe that there is a uh, there's a fly species that actually um, that decapitates ants. They like crawl into their head socket and they decapitate the ant and then emerge out of its skull. So if you want to get really Halloween-y, we could talk about that. My front leg is going off the page and we're not gonna, um, you know, it's just, we're just gonna let it happen. We're not gonna fight it at all. <laughs> we're just gonna, we're just gonna pretend like everything is okay and move on. But I do want to add those really awesome hairs on either side of that first tarsal segment. Those are really cool. Oh no, April, I just saw your um, question that says, what's that part, what's the part called again? And, um, I'm not exactly sure which part you're referring to, but it looks like it might have been back when we were talking about the mesococcus. Um, so that was the, we, we could call it the mesococcal plate that was split in half. That was the, our characteristic for all of the family. Um, and we're moving back there right now, so I can show you this part right here. That's the mesococcal plate. Um, if you wanna kind of break that word down, plate just means it's a piece of the exoskeleton. Um, meso means middle, so they're talking about the middle one, the one that's on the middle leg, and coxa or coxy, um, that's the hip of the insect. And so when we say mesococcal, we're talking about the middle hip bone and it's split. I hope that that was the word you were looking for. Ah, yes, very good, we win, okay. I think the heavens to Jerusalem crickets also, you know, that would not surprise me. We could totally do like a, um, we could do a, a Halloween, we might have to wait until we're a little closer to October, obviously, but we could totally do a Halloween, um, day when we talk about some creepy, we could talk about vampire moths and we could talk about bloodworms and we could talk about parasitoids. I mean, it could be fun. There's our character. All right, so our coxa comes down, our femur comes up, and then our tibia comes out. And really on this specimen, the femur and the tibia are very um, similar to one another. I'm actually going to divide it just a little bit so that you can see the individual pieces. Because um, I brought it, tucked it up like this, and I want to pull it back. Yes, cordyceps. So if we wanted to talk about cordyceps, those are actually really interesting and are a great conversation for Halloween because uh, um, they turn ants into zombies and zombies are another Halloween thing. So maybe I'll make it, how funny would it be if I made it like a TikTok or like a, every day in October, I did a new like Halloween bug or something. We'll see. Um, but there are, that, that cordyceps fungus is actually, uh, it affects the, 
sorry it affects the brain of the ants so if they if the ants get infected with this paras with this parasitic fungus they actually fall out of the they they're living like up in the top of the trees in the jungle and they will actually fall out of the tree and then um they will climb they'll climb back up till they're you know five or six feet off of the ground and then they call it, I think, the bite of death or the jaws of death. The ants will actually gr take their mandibles and grab onto the main um, stem or the main vein of a leaf and they chomp down and then they die. And then the fungus grows out of their head. So these are our tibial, our, these are our tarsal segments. If you want the word tarsal, um, tarsus is an individual tarsus, tarsus segment. Tarsal is a lot of times the word I use. We say tarsal segments a lot. Um, but the plural word are tarsi. So our tarsi, it looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five tarsal segments again. If it goes, yes, every day in October. I mean, it would be kind of fun. I definitely... I don't think I could do a live streams every day, but I think I could probably do like short form videos. It would be kind of crazy though if I did, if I like live streamed every day in October, huh? We could call it something spooky. All right, so that's going to be our middle leg. The femur and the tibia I left pretty simple because, well, my head is starting to get a little tired, so I left it simple. All right, we're going to be moving on to our hind leg here. It's just so pretty. Oh, you know what? I think someone told me that the wing color in Pepsis is actually due to hairs or scales and not due to a pigment. So we're definitely going to be checking out and zooming in on the Pepsis wings so that we can see what is going on there. Invertober. <sighs> Oh man, I love it. And if we called it Invertober, I could do um I could do spiders too. Oh man, you guys are going to convince me into doing this. So you can see our hind leg is set up just a little bit differently. This right here is the coxal segment. You can see it is a little bit separated from the rest of the thorax. So I started my coxal segment, I think, a little too high. It's actually connected kind of low and is pushed a little bit down from where the other segment is. <clears throat> Maybe not that far down. Invertober. You might be able to convince me to do that. All right, so I've got a femur coming up in this direction. That femur goes all the way up over the legs. That is a the hind legs are pretty impressive on um, on pe Pepsis. When they fly through the air, their legs like dangle. They look wild. All right, and then we've got our tibia coming down he from here, maybe down to about here. 
And a lot of times in Pepsis, we'll, you'll see this, especially when we go and look at the tarsal segments, the hind leg is significantly longer than the middle leg. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and check out these tarsal segments. You do not so scary um, October. I like that because I hate when, you know, I don't agree. Um, I'm not going to use hate. Hate's a strong word. I don't agree when people call insects creepy crawlies. I just feel like it gives off the wrong idea, like the wrong concept of insects because you know, I get that they are creepy and that, like, the idea of Halloween is like, ooh, things are spooky. But I would rather them, people just, you know, think of insects as awesome and wild and different and odd rather than creepy. All right, let's see. I'm going to count these um, tarsal segments again. This first tarsal segment, check this out, how long it is. One, two, three, four, five. Looks like it's the same. Um, but that first one is super duper duper long. Like probably double the length of all of the other tarsal segments that we've sketched today. Like all of the other first ones. Alright, so we have our legs kind of taken care of. I'm going to go in and add those really awesome hairs on the hind legs. Um, our hind legs are definitely going to be used for, um, for kind of cleaning off our abdomen. They're very hairy, but also, don't quote me on this, but I would believe you if you told me that tarantula hawks, where they don't dig their own holes, right? They're not diggers. They don't dig their own holes. I would believe you if you told me that sometimes they clean up the holes um, where maybe they have a hole, but they want to take a little bit more dirt out or cover it up, and they would use their legs to kind of push around the sand, I'm erasing Pepsis because, you know, I would much rather have the sketch of my wasp than the words. I'll put the words somewhere else. All right. So I have a head. I have leg segments happening. I have most of a thorax kind of taken care of. I need to kind of connect some of these lines underneath, connect the coxal plates. Um, I'm coming back in and adding this the edge of our of our middle body segment. I want to call it the thorax, but it actually includes one segment of the abdomen. I'm going to call it the thorax from now on. How many tarsi? Five. Five tarsi. Um, so we can see them. This one is one, two, three, four, and then five right here. We need to create a theme that involves a butterfly flying over a theremin. Okay. I'd love to receive a theme from you guys. I don't know how exactly I would create that, but I would accept it.
Yes. All right. So let's talk about the actual insect we're sketching here. This is a pepsis. It's a tarantula hawk, which means that it actually, it's immature stage. It's, um, let's call them larvae. It's larvae feed on tarantulas. All right, so as this adult stage, this is the wasp. So its goal is to fly around and find a tarantula that is close to its burrow. All right, and it flies down to meet the tarantula at the edge of its burrow. And then there is some sort of battle where the tarantula, it's like the tarantula versus the tarantula hawk wasp. And the wasp... Um, its goal is not to kill the tarantula, but to parasitize it. The wasp is just trying to sting the tarantula so that it can paralyze it. All right. So the tarantula hawk will sting a tarantula. It'll paralyze it. And if it's not all the way down in its burrow already, the tarantula hawk will drag the tarantula down into its own burrow where it will lay an individual egg on the exoskeleton of the tarantula. All right, that egg hatches before the tarantula wakes up, right? And it will start feeding on the tarantula while the tarantula is paralyzed, but definitely still alive. And it kills the tarantula. So, yes, that's what these guys do. Um, she will lay her egg. She generally will wait to actually lay the egg until they are underground. And no, she doesn't use her, she doesn't dig her own burrows. Like cicada killers, they're going to dig their own burrows. And they're going to be strong enough that the, um... They're going to be strong enough that the that the wasp has the ability to actually carry the cicada in the air. Whereas tarantula hawks, they don't really ever carry the um, they don't really ever carry the tarantula through the air, right? They're more like um, they more have the strength to drag a tarantula than to actually uh, than to actually fly with it. All right, so there's a couple of things I want to do. I want to zoom in on the wings so that I can show you how cool they are. I'm going to go ahead and kind of just darken the edges of the wings because the I know the wings are orange, but the edges tend to have these dark shadows, and I want to kind of add those for decoration. Let's go check this out. little hairs in focus I can see them but they are so small that I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get a really good image of them and yes a cicada is significantly smaller and significantly lighter than a tarantula um, oh I know what I can use I have like all types of specialized trays that I use now under my microscope to make sure I don't hurt friends. I had one or two specimens get hurt when I first started doing this, so now we make sure that everything is good. Alright, so I'm going to try... I'm going to try to show us the tarantula hawk's mouth parts head on. But for me to do that, I'm going to have to adjust the actual head of my microscope. So give me two seconds. I 
I normally don't. Ah, yes, Aisha asked um, if I could explain the wing colorations again. So um, I was told that the coloration on the wings was not because the wings were pigmented, but because the hairs um, were orange and that they were so small and so fine and covered the wings so completely that it makes the wings look orange, right? So I tried to zoom in on the wings to see if I could get individual hairs to show. Um, and I can see it on my side of the microscope, but it was just too hard to get really in focus on the computer. I'm really excited that we can see these mouth parts. what is happening here because as you see there are so many pieces happening um so we can look all the way up here at the top there's lo looks like this triangular piece up here in between that's the upper lip we call that the labrum all right that's the upper lip then you have two mandibles up here in the front. These are used for chewing. So chewing pollen, um, that's a powder, that's a solid. Uh, I don't know what else these guys would really chew, chew on, um, unless they found something really sweet like a fruit. They could chew on a fruit. Um, but here, this, this is a mandible here that ends right about here, and there's another mandible that comes over this way. And then I mentioned it was lapping, right? So it's not a straw. It's not actually drinking its food. It just sticks this kind of forked like tongue down into yummy sugarness, sugary goodness, and it will lap up food that way. Um, that tongue does have the ability to kind of, um, to kind of hide between these two darker pieces here and there. Those two pieces are along the edges of that kind of tongue-like mouth part. And that's like its protective sheath. Um, and so that's kind of like a protective sheath for the mouth, for the tongue when it's not actively drinking. Um, this guy died sticking his tongue out. But you know what? I kind of love it when they do that because then we get to see the entire series of all of the different mouth parts that are happening. Um, and from this angle, you can definitely see all four um, mouth um, fingers, all of these palps. So you've got the labial palps down here on the bottom because they're connected to the, <clears throat> to the bottom jaw. And then you have the maxillary palps up here, which I thought originally were three segmented, but looking at it from this angle, they, they look like they're one, two, three, four, almost five segmented. They look like they're five segmented from this side. And I would definitely say this is a better view than we were seeing from the other side. Kind of, Susan. Um, <clears throat> insects' mouths. Uh, let me see. All right, I'm gonna show you two two different diagrams of insect mouths. Um, they come from different books, but what I want to show you is I'm gonna show you the mouth part of a grasshopper because that's where that's kind of all of the basic. It's kind of like the basic mouth of an insect. It's um, the grasshopper's mouth is the first mouth that pretty much anybody learns. Okay.
switch over to my cam table camera for a minute. So, um, this is a grasshopper's head, and, um, the LBR, that stands for labrum, <clears throat> and so that's, you know, the upper lip that we were just seeing, the two mandibles coming down from the sides, you've got these mouth fingers, or the palpi, um, and then there's the maxillary, and then LBM stands for the labium, which is the bottom lip, so you have the labrum on the top and the labium on the bottom. Um, and so that's going to kind of be your basic chewing mouth part. Everybody who has a chewing mouth part has one of these. Now, in, um, in bees and wasps, you can have this type of mouth part where you still, let me double check. I believe you still pretty much have all the same pieces. They're just reorganized. Maybe not exactly. So you still have your mandibles on the side. You still have a little labrum. You still have um, the lab the palps down here. But then I I thought that the that the straw like that the the sucking type mouth part was an adaptation of the maxillary. Um, but they are calling it something else. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, I was right. So, um, MX, it's going to stand for maxillary. So, the outside, that sheath of that mouth part are the, is the maxillary. So, right here, that sheath-like mouth part, that's the maxillary, and all insects have it. It's just a different shape. Um, and my guess, because this tongue segment, that's really the segment that's unique to, um, the wasps that everyone else doesn't seem to have. And so I was checking it out to see what that's all about, but that's just called the flabellum. If you guys would like a new word, I don't think I've shared this word with you yet. That's the straw-like mouth part right here in the center. We call it the flabellum. <laughs> Uppy down parts. Yeah, exactly. There's, <laughs> there's, um, the up part and the bottom part. And they go up and down, and they kind of eat, but then they chew back and forth, too. I've always loved watching insect mouth parts move. I've always found it fascinating. And when I was a young child, my mom will even, my mom will even come in and, like, confirm it. Um, when I was a young child, I would run around the backyard and hand collect grasshoppers. And then I would hold them by their back legs and get a piece of grass and, like, force feed the grasshopper while I was watching it so that I could watch him chew on, his, chew on the grass. Um, so I definitely caught grasshoppers and forced them to eat for me so that I could watch their mouth parts go wild. Does the flabellum correspond to the butterfly's proboscis? I do not think that's the case. I think that the butterfly's proboscis is a modified maxillary. I will admit the modifications on the mouth parts was one thing that... Um, I definitely got a point or two off on a couple exams because I didn't know exactly how the mouth parts had, were adapted from one another. Oh, there it is. No, the proboscis is just the proboscis. I think, um, so I think that it, the 
proboscis is modified from the maxillary. Because it's um, kind of this sheath. <clears throat> yes. The uh, butterfly's proboscis is an adaptation from the maxillary. Um, Wikipedia actually has a really cool insect mouth parts um, picture where you can see um, they actually color code the different parts of the mouth and then they show it on different insects so you can see how those different adaptations exist on different insects. Yes. Um, Susan, you would be correct with that. Um, it is a two pieces that has to kind of zip up or combine. And I would almost say that it is three pieces, like a true bug's mouth part, um, because there's the outside piece, there's the other outside piece, but then there's a tube that goes down the center, and that's the actual tube that, that she uses to drink. And then sometimes at the tip of the butterfly's proboscis, it'll actually be flared out so you can see all of the pieces. Sometimes a butterfly will pass with all those pieces aligned. Um, but it's kind of like this, just longer, where you have a sheath that's in two pieces and then a straw down the center. Except the proboscis is obviously longer and it's got segments and all those types of things. Man, we did good today. Um, we got all of the mouth part talk taken care of. Oh. I think I did pretty good with answering all of your questions. Um, is there, a, someone asked me if there was a tibial spine on the last leg. The answer is yes. I'm sorry I didn't show that. I actually believe that the tibial spines on the hind leg are even cooler than the front and the middle, the front and the middle legs because I think the tibia not only has one spine, but a crown of spines around its leg. All right, so from this view, we can see that there is two spines on the tibia. Um, they're kind of in this V-shape here. And there are a number of kind of half size spines along the top too. The light is hitting the abdomen so perfectly right now. So now we can see how the top of the abdominal segments connect with the bottom abdo abdomen segments. And I was trying to get the lighting to do this earlier, and it wasn't, um, but now it is. So I'm going to take, take advantage of this and go ahead and get my midline sketched in. So um, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys. This is the midline of our wasp, and we're going to, I'm actually going to put it right about here. And so when I'm sketching a midline, I go ahead and I give just one straight line all the way across. And that's where I know the segments are going to be changing. And then I go from the top and I round out a segment kind of just like this. And I round off each one of those segments kind of where those lines are. All right, kind of like that. And then I will pull the um, the bottom segment kind of like this just in a little bit. And then I make sure that it all connects up. So this is where you can see the difference between a sternite and a turgite. Um, so the 
tergites are the ones that are on the top. And the sternites are the ones on the bottom. Or if you imagine like your sternum, if you are walking like this, um, the sternites are the ones on the bottom. And yes, now I will zoom out so you can see the wings. <laughs> I love April that you're going to be telling people to quit flapping their flabellum. Your flabellum is flabbing. All right, so that is as far out as I can make it. But what I can do is that it's not a microscope image, but eventually it will. Yeah, there it goes. It can't, it'll focus. So that is our Pepsis, um, a little bit about its life cycle, a little bit about where it was from. If you did, um, I can go ahead and turn myself off for a minute. This is the environment that my tarantula hawk was found in. Um, I believe this picture was just a couple minutes after I collected it. Um, so if you would like, oopsies. Um, that's what it looks like. And about time to head off. All right, so the wings. So the wings on a tarantula hawk, we call them membranous wings. So they're the same as like any other wasp or bee. Um, these wings, you may not believe me, but they are see-through. The coloring comes from the little itty bitty micro hairs that are on them. Um, so they are just as thin and fragile as any other wasp wings. Um, beetle wings, Beetles have elytra, which are those really hard outer shells, and they have membranous wings that are underneath their elytra. So these guys have different wing types um, than beetles do. Um, our wasp does have four wings. They have two membranous wings in the front and two membranous wings in the back. If we look right about... If we look right about here where it looks like the wings get lighter and then darker, that's actually darker right there because there's another layer of wing. Um, that's the second pair of wing kind of underneath. The second pair is just a little bit shorter than the first pair. Oh, yay, April. I'm so happy that you enjoyed. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn on our closer page. So I want to say thank you to all of you out there who spent the last hour and 45 minutes, almost two hours, um, with me chatting bugs and talking about adaptations and drawing a tarantula hawk. Um, I had a great time and I'm glad that you guys, uh, convinced me to get it off of the board. Um, I, on Sunday, pinned all of these beautiful underwing moths 
so that video is recorded and available to you. I'll go ahead and tease a couple of them. Um, and that video is available to you. You can always just go and check them out. I do have another series of Sphinx Moth or of Underwing Moths that I still have to pin. So I might be doing those live too. If you know a student who is between the ages, well, is, uh, you know, elementary age, age 5 to 8, 9 to 12, or if you know someone in high school who just wants a bug class, I teach on a platform called OutSchool, and this is where students that are 9 to 12, 5 to 8, they actually get to do a Zoom class with me, and they get to meet each other, too, and they get to meet bug lovers from around the world. I have international students and students here in the U.S. I have students who are always bringing me the cool bugs to share with me and I just love it so if you know somebody you can go and check it out the link if you use the link in the description box you get $20 free from out school all right so they will give you money to take my classes you should do that um, I have a YouTube channel. That's where you are right now. Go ahead and make sure you subscribe if you haven't. Thank you, everybody who is here for the first time. I always super appreciate you. That is my PayPal. That's where you can go ahead and send me a little tip if you've really enjoyed hanging out with me today, if you learned something new, if you learned something and you're excited about sharing it with a friend or with a family member. Go ahead and send me a coffee. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been really really busy working and doing all of the different things and so hopefully when I have a pr project or two slow down I'll be able to get um, posting whiteboard videos again I'd really love to start doing that and if you're ever looking for me on social media and you can't find me at Insectopia it's because my ta hashtag is Insectopia 2015 um, on Instagram and on Facebook so if you're looking for me on a social media you can find me there all oh, right. I have not seen the latest Ant Lab slow motion video, but I am going to have to check it out. <clears throat> Yay, coffee. I definitely agree, April. S April. So, okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you had as great of a time as I did. Um, I am so happy that we have such a lovely group that um, communicates and chats and asks all types of buggy-related questions. Um, I always, it always just makes me smile, you know, to come down here and spend my night with you. So um, thank you so much, and I will be live streaming again on Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern or next Thursday um, at this time. So I will see everyone next week. Um, bye, everyone, Deb and Susan and April and Avea. Um, I hope you all have an Ayesha. Um, I think that's everyone who is here right now. Um, so thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your night.